genetically Hey there folks, Mark Edwards here, and you're watching the Reasoning Aloud YouTube channel and podcast. And today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Aranok. Aranok is a YouTuber whose content revolves around media criticism, uh, specifically media criticism as it relates to disability advocacy, trans and queer advocacy and representation, and other things along that line. Uh, I really enjoy their content, and I was really happy to get them on the show to talk. Uh, we have a very long, very, I think, productive conversation that I really enjoyed. In the interview itself, we talk about difficulty settings in video games uh, and what that means for accessibility for those who are disabled. We talk about queer and trans representation in media. Uh, we also talk about specific versus essentialist criticisms of content creators who may have said or done problematic things and how that relates to what the right sometimes likes to call cancel culture. At one point, we spend a good chunk of the conversation talking about Dune and discussing the complicated relationship that a lot of us, particularly a lot of us on the left, have with that book. Uh, it's one of my favorite books in Aranox as well, and I particularly enjoyed that part of the interview. And we talk about a whole lot more. Uh, this, I believe, is my longest interview to date, and it was also one of my favorites, uh, so I think you're going to like it. Before we go any further, I want to give a special shout out to my patrons, whose names will be appearing on the screen now. If you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron. Right now, I don't have any tiers. It's sort of a just give me what you think I'm worth kind of a deal. And you get early access to the audio of all of these podcasts. Once I can get enough patrons, I'll invest in a video subscription service and I can start getting you early access to the video as well. If you don't want to subscribe monthly, uh, you can give me a one-time tip via Venmo or Cash App. I have PayPal links, but currently there's a problem with my PayPal tip jar, and I think I may suspend that service uh, indefinitely and look into something else like coffee or one of the other tipping services. But for now, Venmo and Cash App are the best ways to give me a one-time tip if that's something that you think I deserve. If you can't support the show directly, uh, financially, then you can still help me grow by giving five-star reviews on iTunes or Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts, by liking and subscribing here on YouTube, and by sharing all these videos with your friends and family and coworkers on your social places and tweety spots or wherever else you interact with people online. Anything that you can do to grow my brand within the algorithm really helps me out. Uh, because it puts me in front of more people who can engage with my content. If you want to leave a comment, I'm always up for engaging with people who like and follow what I do, and that also helps me as well. I also have a second channel called RA Clips, which you will find linked on the main page of my YouTube channel. On that, I cut up these interviews into shorter sections so that you can more easily digest them if you don't want to sit down and watch a two-hour conversation in one go. Uh, so go ahead and go over there, like and subscribe to that, share that with your friends, all that good stuff. That also really helps me out. You can also find me on Twitch, where I'm currently streaming Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines at increasingly stochastic intervals of time, basically whenever I have free time when I get home from work. Uh, I have also started doing this thing where I watch another content creator's video before I start playing to help get their engagements up. So if you pop in and you see me watching a video, you can follow the link to that other person's content, and we can all upvote their stuff together and help get them some views. Which, speaking of other content creators, I do want to give a special shout out to Ponderful, uh, who uh, designed this shirt, uh, which says, I'd watch me. Um, she made this shirt, uh, I believe, specifically at my request, or at least my strong insistence on Twitter. Uh, and I bought it immediately. Uh, and if you want to help her out, you can go subscribe to her channel. I'll link down there in the show notes as well on that. She does wonderful content on autism and neurodivergence and leftism as well. And uh, on a long enough timeline, when our schedules eventually line up, uh, I believe she's going to be a guest on the show as well. So definitely go check her out. 
You can also find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Reasoning Aloud. I'm mostly active on Twitter. Uh, I post all of my video links on Facebook, and on Instagram I post pictures of my cat. He's very cute, so if that's what you're into, go check that out. I also need to say before we get started that there are some content warnings associated with today's video. Uh, Aranok and I talk frankly about drug use, drug addiction, uh, eugenics, uh, ableism, and transphobia. So if any of those things is going to be particularly upsetting to you or make you uncomfortable, then I'm not going to take it personally if you skip this one. And with all of that said and done, I give you Aranok. Aranok, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I've been wanting to get a hold of you on the channel for a little while now. How are you doing? Ah, uh, you know, uh, about about as well as you can be uh, with with things the way they are right now, which is a a mixed bag of feelings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, um, my sister had to go get tested for COVID because um, a kid at her school who was fully vaccinated and was following things properly um, tested positive. And, uh, and so, yeah, like, uh, yeah, so, mm. so my sister and, um, my sister's friend who lives with my parents and my sister, um, both had to go get tested today. So like, that, that's the type of stuff that's going on where it's like, eh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've been, uh, my partner and I have been, uh, getting tested every so often, just every time we get like a sniffle like we go because of the we're both paramedics so like it's just it's uh it's nerve-wracking waiting on mm -hmm. that email um so i have been uh following your work for a little while now um and you have a, a fairly eclectic uh <laughs> catalog and like you you've you've been on the youtube scene for like uh like a six months now it looks like and mm -hmm. in that time in a in a very short number of videos you've hit like a wide swath of stuff so we've got a lot to talk about um but your most recent video uh and i think that's a good way to get into your content is mm -hmm. uh you spent time talking about disability and gaming specifically relating to difficulty settings and things like that and uh do you maybe want to just kind of introduce people to to that and yeah i think and i think it's a good way of explaining kind of the the general um aspects of my channel for some context um my my degree is uh not complete but my the degree that i'm pursuing is in computer science i'm in my uh last year in a bit i'm actually um second aim on a paper that's in the process of being published on uh, pandemic spread simulation i can't really talk any details beyond that yeah. until it is published but Oh, um looking forward to it but yeah my specialization is kind of focused a lot on uh machine learning and ai but also in in actual game theory which is not that terrible youtube channel or economists complete misunderstanding of the topic <laughs> um <laughs> uh it's uh, it is very much about how people make decisions and 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 how systems inform the way that people will make decisions and influence the decisions that we make and um and AI and machine learning is very much also about about how things make decisions. So so you could say that that uh I I have an obsession with the way that uh that things influence other things into making a decision. <laughs> and um and a lot of my work is is very focused on identity and uh which I it's it's I'm trans. I came out in the last year, or so my my first video was actually my my coming out video to my, um, you know, extended family and and friends and things. Um, though I I had been out and doing um charity stream work for almost two years. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that point, um, and for a good year and a half of that, I was I was out openly, um, at least uh, online, um. And yeah, so so my my, my most recent video, I, I kind of wanted to examine the way that the the sort of um, gamer identity plays into like ideological beliefs about how um, art should be created, and the ways that um, it clashes a lot with with actual designers' methodology and beliefs and and ideological viewpoints. Not that designers are a monolith. 
But there are certain things that are taught generally, that are generally seen as the majority viewpoint. And one of those things, which is directly in the title of the video, is that difficulty settings are accessibility settings. Um, mm -hmm. Most university programs on the topic will touch on that pretty quick. It's like Game Design 101, <laughs> because um, I guess we got to talk about what accessibility means. Um, yeah, it, sure. It, it sounds like it could be complicated. It's, it's pretty straightforward. It just means that uh, whether or not um, groups of people have access to a thing in the context of art, making art accessible just means making the art uh, in such a way that, that someone can experience it. Um, and accessibility isn't exclusively about disability, but it affects disabled people a lot more often. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want examples of like, accessibility affecting non-disabled people uh height limits on a ride right mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's if you're shorter it's not a disability you mm -hmm. know but uh if if you have to be over six feet to get into something um most people can't access the thing mm -hmm. um and accessibility means altering things or, or changing things in such a way that that they can access it um generally when you're making a game uh you want people to play the game which which is a wild concept <laughs> i know <laughs> and uh and and something that a lot of um i, I refer to them as gamer tm uh, mm -hmm. in the video uh, uh that very specific very toxic form of um a community that's built around gaming uh they really dislike engaging with that mm -hmm. um and they they tend to get extra angry about difficulty setting stuff, but they generally dislike accessibility settings that just exist in general. Um, yeah. And part of that's in presentation, right? Um, I I think sometimes using the term difficulty can can indicate the wrong thing to the wrong audience if they don't understand what the purpose of the wording is. Um, which is why I prefer like. Celeste, for example, which I also use in the video, calls it uh, assist mode. And I think it's a much more accurate term mm -hmm. to what its purpose and, and goal is. Um, and the other thing that the video is touching on is authorial intent. Um, because a lot of the uh, sort of gamer argument is in this idea that, that playing at a lower difficulty means you are um, ignoring the author's intent or not achieving the author's intent. Which the, the underlying argument there is that authorial intent must inherently have greater value, which is silly on the face of it. Um, I don't agree with that, and and when we get to some of my other work, you'll <laughs> you'll see why. <laughs> um, right. But but I but for the purpose of the video to ex explain why um, their beliefs are so faulty and clearly just based off of this sort of identity relationship, um, was was in demonstrating that even if you accept authorial intent is, is the ultimate arbiter um most game designers intend for people who need who need it in assist mode or, or a different difficulty setting um to have access to it because the goal with those settings existing which again the author put them in the work it is an intended part of the work <laughs> it seems silly to have to say it but um it, it's about allowing people to to get to experience the work um and this doesn't just affect disabled people though it affects disabled people disproportionately or more mm -hmm. often um if but but like it, it it isn't just about disabled people it's about people who've never played a game before too right yeah. it's about people who are trying to get into the medium uh it's about kids it's about um you know, people who don't have the time necessarily to dedicate to developing a skill set just to experience a piece of art. Um, mm -hmm. And well, it's like you said, I mean, you it I, I can't imagine somebody spending, you know, a year, two years, some five years working on a piece of art and then <laughs> gatekeeping that from a significant portion of the public because they can't, you know, <laughs> because they're not elite enough to <laughs> to click the keys in the precise right speed to, yeah to appeal and, to appease to like the the identity group that gave us gamer gate like that just is a, <laughs> a bizarre 
<laughs> he is bizarre. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think that's a good way of putting it. And again, it's uh, as I say in the video, you know, it, it is very much about this like identity that they've built up around accomplishment and their idea of what accomplishment means mm -hmm. and the way that they kind of get it a little backwards. Um, I, you know, accomplishment, at least to me, and and this is coming from my athlete background. I was a uh, was a high level rower for a very 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 long time. I uh, I also coached professionally for for some time as well. Um, my my former rowing pair partner is on the national has been on the national team for years. Like right. <laughs> very interconnected with the the competitive side of that sport. Um, if you know anything about rowing, you know it's a it is a brutal sport. It's a very very difficult, very physically demanding sport. But um, what I love about its community is it is a very encouraging one. That at least in my experience, I can't speak to the global context. Um, I can only speak to Canadian rowing and my personal experiences with it. Um, but it is very much about, you know, um, accomplishing goals for yourself. And those goals are relative to your skill point, where you're at. And, and accomplishment is about, you know, overcoming an obstacle that is, that is, uh, that is for yourself. Um, now, I don't, I don't think all, like, engagement with video games needs to be around the idea of, a, uh, of, of accomplishment, right? Mm -hmm. But, again... If we take their premise, their premise that accomplishments are the ultimate goal, um, just like if we take their idea that authorial intent is the you know <laughs> one thing that matters, uh, though as I demonstrate in the video, they they quite often actually contradict that argument with their own actions, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, like modding and and speed running and those sorts of things that quite often right. do things that were never intended by the by the author. Um, it's it's about the personal engagement and relationship to difficulty that matters and not this universal concept of difficulty because uh let's take like a a silly example but let's say you have like a five-year-old kid that's real short and like an adult man really tall can jump real high um and you ask both of them to like jump onto a stool the kid jumps onto the stool. It's a lot bigger of an achievement than if the adult grown ass man <laughs> jumps on the stool, right? Yeah. Um, for them personally, because it's about their relationship to the the stool. So, uh, I don't know if it's the best example, but it's it's a simple example that's like really mm -hmm. easy to visualize. Um, right. So, yeah, like I I I think um I think people have a very limited understanding of like what what accomplishment means because they go well i felt accomplished by doing this and they assume that experience is universal mm. um that it's not subjective and with a lot of parsing um sillier viewpoints is understanding <laughs> their assumptions like like and and then being able to demonstrate what their assumptions are, which is why I was really, really thankful that um, Colin Moriarty uh, just kind of laid bare a lot of their beliefs um, <laughs> in those, those those tweets that I cite, because mm -hmm. it, it really does just like perfectly lay out in, in only two tweets, a lot of details of their viewpoint and... Uh, it was it was kind of yeah it was just a fascinating piece to engage with because I just kind of wanted to dig into like both this disconnect between the authorial side of art creation and like what 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 designers are thinking about um uh you know I actually cite uh, some designers in in the video as well who, who directly state what what their viewpoint on it is mm -hmm. and and that disconnect between them and and I would say the the very loud minority of people who play games um and I can prove that statistically because the actual majority of people who play games play them casually mm -hmm. uh usually on their phone but also um more chill style games at home uh this is very easy to find research on that like if you want to look at like I I guarantee you look up any sort of statistic around um like market share where the majority of games game sales are where the majority of gameplay is um you'll find that most people who play games are casual mm -hmm. um the the sort of elitist crowd that are very loud the people who have this identity of gamer um 
who who have developed this sort of commodity identity um are a niche minority um <laughs> which isn't good or bad but it it yeah. is telling how much things cater to them <laughs> well i think it becomes like a problem because there's nothing wrong with having mm -hmm. people who are um invested in an art form and playing it a particular way like nobody is going to say speedrunners oh. should stop doing what they're doing but the problem is I... speedrunners don't tell everybody else that they need to speed <laughs> run the game um, exactly, the, exactly. the issue is not with what they're doing the issue is with the evangel or um, evangelizing of it um, yeah the sort of proselytizing of like this is the one true method of engaging with art which is laughable Which, on so many levels um, if... <laughs> i'll just go ahead and piss off every one of those people uh the i played the last of us and uh i got to when they mm -hmm. to right after um it's a 12 year old game i'm gonna spoil it for everybody uh right after joel uh gets like takes a rebar through the gut like i stopped mm -hmm. playing it at that point because i couldn't stand the way the game was played like the controls and yeah. I, I just watched a YouTube video of somebody else play it. So like my <laughs> experience with probably one of the better video games in the last 20 years is I watched it on YouTube because I didn't like playing it. And that's perfectly fine. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, you engaged with the art in a way that was more meaningful to you. Mm -hmm. um, You're getting what you valued out of it. Actually, that's that's a major problem I have with with Naughty Dog's design ethos. Um, mm -hmm. I think they should be making TV because they clearly just want to yeah. make TV. Um, I'm actually really excited yeah, for that would the have been an amazing of... miniseries. Well, and they're turning it into a show. Like they're turning into a big budget HBO show, and I think it's going to be probably some of the best zombie media we've ever gotten. Yeah, um, I didn't know but, that. It's amazing. But like from what I have seen, the majority of of people get out of The Last of Us cinematic aspects, mm -hmm. um, and quite often, um, particularly in The Last of Us Two, I'm going to piss off a lot of people with this. <laughs> Um, particularly with The Last of Us 2, uh, there's there's a misunderstanding, and I, I'm not sure, like, I, I, I don't want to call it bad. I get what they were going for. Um, I just don't think, like, I, I just have some very specific feelings about how, um, how I view games as an art form that are very, very subjective. It's very much just what I, what I get out of it. But, um, th they, they have times where the thing that your gameplay is saying is opposing the message of your plot and story and themes um in so in what way uh, the, so I, I haven't actually where... played the last of us yeah, two, no. <laughs> um which is fine to spoil it because i sat next to somebody who was playing it um, <laughs> so i i kind of like got the same experience but i i only paid yeah. attention to like half of it so and um, i want to be very clear i am not critiquing mm -hmm. the story writing the mm -hmm. characters i'm critiquing very specifically the ludo narrative elements because a lot of people got pissed off at this game for very silly reasons mm -hmm. i'm just gonna say this right now as an athlete abby's not even that fit <laughs> like she's she's a she is an average athlete i would actually expect her to be buffer considering like some of the story elements anyway <laughs> like i i've spent a lot of my life around professional athletes abby yeah. is someone who works out in the gym repeatedly every week and and is yeah. a completely normal body type and if you have a problem with that i didn't even know that people were upset go about work that out. <laughs> like go to a gym meet some people who work out because clearly you haven't interacted with with uh athletes who are women like uh, so I'm how? actually I don't know what any of the criticisms of The Last of Us Two are. I oh, I, I avoided it completely. Do not want to. A lot of a lot of people have terrible criticisms. Um, a lot of it's rooted in transphobia. A lot of it's mm. rooted in in sexism. Was um was um, Abby supposed to be trans? Or no, I... no, but but transphobes are weird. Um, mm -hmm. and they decided that because Abby was um you know like, slightly buff, mm -hmm. uh, that meant she must be a trans woman, which was mm. just. I, I, that's I a whole can of worms. That's a whole can of worms. <laughs> that's just like I don't even want to dive into how ridiculous they are. But I just want to be careful that like when when I critique an aspect of The Last mm -hmm. of Us Two, because of how often the people critiquing it are just like the worst people, um, that like my problem is not with the storytelling in right. those other elements. But there there are there are scenes where what you are doing with the controller 
what your engagement with the character is are contradictory to the message it's trying to come across. Um, because when you're in control of a character, um, it's not going to be the same for everybody, but in general, the message is that you are doing the thing, mm-hmm. right? So there are scenes where the point is, is that you're supposed to dislike what the, I don't even have to talk about it specifically. I can talk about it generally where, mm-hmm. where the protagonist is doing something that is detestable and the message is supposed to be, this is bad of the character to do. The problem is that because you have control, that is not the message the ludo narrative elements are telling you. The ludo narrative elements are telling you, you are bad for doing this. Mm. And I think that's why some people got really uncomfortable with it. Now, I don't think discomfort's a bad thing in art. I think you can make really incredible art specifically with uh, discomfort in mind. Spec Ops the line comes to mind. Exactly. Yeah. Spec Ops the line is very much about specifically engaging with that, but that's not what Last of Us was going for, at right. least as far as I can tell. So it's it's one of those things where like if it was a TV show, these cinematic elements are working excellently. The the, the message is coming across. But because they, they want, oh, but it's still a game, we have to have control in this scene. Um it kind of undercuts what they're trying to go for because people get defensive mm. when you say you're being bad. Now, there are other stuff where like, I, I do think that, that it works well in that way because it's, it is kind of critiquing violence in video games to mm-hmm. some degree. So things like forcing you to control killing the dogs, you know, in combat, like that, that's getting the message across a little bit better. But in the moments where it's clearly trying to talk about Ellie as a character, not the player controlling ellie hmm. um they should have been more confident with their with their cinematic elements and just let the the scene play out um yeah but it, it is very much a situation of um to me you choose a medium for a reason right and you should mm-hmm. use that medium to its fullest um again celeste is just a game that i adore like it's such a brilliant piece of art and one of the best elements about Celeste is how often it uses control to increase empathy between the player and the character and have that um, unique experience that interactive media can have. And I say interactive media because it's not exclusive to video games. Um, tabletop role-playing games actually often achieve this emotionality much, like even more, more powerfully. Mm-hmm. Um, but because you feel like you're the one doing it, you're in the moment you're feeling that power, like that sort of interconnection with the character much more strongly. And I think that's part of why it's kind of harder to tell a story that's critical of the player character mm. than it is to be critical of the protagonist in, say, a TV show or a movie. Um, I think it's achievable. I think Spec Ops The Line, again, is a good example. And, and Spec Ops The Line is very much engaged in like making the player uncomfortable with what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's... It's sometimes a little on the nose, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Like, I, I don't think subtlety is inherently good or bad. I think it depends the the context. Well, I think it... uh, the target audience for that game was also people who uh, they mm-hmm. went into GameStop and they didn't have the Call of Duty game they came in there to get. So they picked up Spec Ops. So yeah. I forgive them for being on the nose. <laughs> no, with I it. think being on the nose was good for that audience. Yeah. I think that that works. Um, but it's also very clear about what it's saying. Like. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have the sort of muddled messaging thing where it's like, are you talking to the player or the character? Okay, you're trying to talk about the the character, but it's coming across as talking to the player, and that yeah. I just I I wish um I wish it felt like Naughty Dog making games like that medium had any sort of meaning to to them beyond just like oh we happen to make games, mm-hmm. um. Because a lot of the time, uh, uh, from the writing staff end, um, and I want to be clear, like if you love the gameplay and stuff, that's, that's totally cool. I'm talking about how the gameplay like reinforces messaging and and storytelling, and and like what is the point of of um. So so Ludo means game for context or play. Uh, so Ludo narrative means the the, the play narrative, the the narrative that's told through gameplay, and I just think um, quite often with the sort of cinematic style games, uh, they're kind of missing out on engaging with, with the art form of interactive media as much as they could be 
if they weren't so obsessive with like chasing TV and me- movies, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they're very open about it. Like, they, <clears throat> you know, they constantly talk about like, we brought in TV writers and we're trying to be like TV. Like, look at the cinematic elements. We're trying to make it realistic. And I'm like, the most emotionally touching games I've ever seen are pieces like Gris, um, or sorry, it's the French pronunciation. It's Gris, but uh, cause it's, it's Spanish, mm-hmm. I believe. Um, but we're Italian. I can't remember. Anyway, it's Greece. Uh, I'm French speaking, so I was I was in French immersion, so I, I I tend to say Gris, but that's not the correct pronunciation for that game. Anyway, Greece or or Celeste or um, those are the ones that are jumping out in my mind because I've played them recently. Uh, Super Hot does an excellent job of telling its story through through gameplay as well. Super Hot um, is excellent. Super Hot's excellent. Uh, like I can go through you know a list of just stuff where like the way you interact with the world is so 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 core to the messaging um yeah and and i think that's particularly with naughty dog the gaming seems like secondary yeah and (laughs) i actually think um in a in a number of ways it's actually a reinforcing of some of the the worst aspect of the fandom because like you said it's putting you in a position where the player is doing these terrible things Mm -hmm. and you already have a problem with a game that's centered around people like joel and ellie and all these characters who are i hesitate to use the word bad people but they're not you wouldn't want to hang out with them Uh, (laughs) i I, I would say that there are people in horrible situations mm -hmm. that do horrifically nasty things Mm -hmm. and sometimes like completely unnecessarily because it's i mean the world they live in and yeah and and it's mixed with this sort of like Last of Us Two is about about the fruit, like how how pointless revenge mm-hmm. is, and the fact that like people need to be more, um, you know, ready to be uh, understanding of other perspectives. Like I I actually think that like there there are some, ludolo- like ludological elements that are really really brilliantly used. I I think the the switch in protagonist right in player character that intimate thing of of switching from this character that you had from the first game to seeing the perspective of the person you've been hunting down Mm -hmm. um at the halfway point is is quite brilliant i just also think it's not paced the best and um and i just think it's it's in the it's in the specific details where it falters rather than like the those broad strokes like i think um there are other pieces that have done that like switching of viewpoint more effectively um in the same medium and i think there's more to be done with that like i'd really Mm. really love to see more more pieces that engage with like playing as uh problematic people like Mm -hmm. and i I, yeah i I don't think bad is the right term because i think it's so simple Full. Yeah. Like, it's 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 not engaging with the sort of complexities of like these are flawed people they mm-hmm. make poor decisions sometimes often out of certain emotions that are very understandable and yeah i just well, yeah anytime you have characters like that um mm-hmm. you're going to attract a certain type of audience like and it's the people who think you know the joker and tyler durden were characters that should be emulated right there are people out there who didn't get that joel was supposed to be a tragic complicated character they think joel is a badass and when you put them in a position where they're having to personally do the worst aspects of his character the easy thing to do for that person is to just lean in and say actually joel's right to do this and it Mm -hmm. i think Mm -hmm. it pushes it makes them more defensive like it's again it's like if the message is supposed to be what joel is doing here is like wrong but people do shitty things for complicated reasons and like uh like they've been pretty clear about like joel's the bad guy like <laughs> like yeah. joel is not a hero um what joel does at the I end mean, of the joel's first been game, pretty clear the, about that from, <laughs> joel joel too but like like the, the writers like yeah, yeah regardless of whether or not like they succeeded that that was their goal and i think mm-hmm. kind of just dis- well i think we're kind of discussing um a bit of like authorial intent mixed with mm-hmm. like uh artistic purpose and 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 attempts at achievement and um yeah i i think you know as we were saying earlier like i think why spec ops works in a way that this fails is that spec ops 
never ever falters in saying like this is wrong <laughs> like mm-hmm. th- these things are wrong and there's no wiggle room and i think there there's a point where you have to be horrifically unsubtle um unfortunately there are people who will not get it no matter what you do like yeah. there are people that think that starship troopers the film not the book it's mocking that starship troopers the film um supports their fascist bullshit and it's like no that this is a work by a jewish like writer director who is very focused on mocking fascist um, propaganda. That's the entire film is about. It's so explicit that when I saw it, when I was like 10 mm-hmm. with my dad, I was just like, this is about Nazi Germany, right? Like, <laughs> like it's so unsubtle about like it hates fascists. And, and that's the point. Um, uh, or a Robocop, which is another work by Paul Verhoeven mm-hmm. that, that does, it's doing the same thing, but it's towards capitalism and stuff because like you have to be really explicit about it or, or a certain type of people will co-opt it. I think yeah. um, a, I'm reminded of that scene from a uh, jar head where everybody's gathered around watching apocalypse now and cheering. Mm-hmm. Right. Like there it's, there's, what is that? Fr- I can't remember the, how the, exactly the phrase goes, but it's, you can never make an anti-war film. Um, cause some number of people will always find it compelling and like, mm-hmm. and I don't, I don't know if there's a solution to that. Like, I don't yeah. know if there's actually a point where you can be unsubtle enough without like damaging the art for everybody yeah. else. Um, because like for these people, I think you'd literally need to like, <laughs> I, I, and I might do this sometime is, is, uh, it, in a video, it's, it's kind of a funny idea, but like literally pause what's happening and just have the director like walk out as if it's like a green screen in front and just be like this is the message of the film <laughs> they, <laughs> like, they did that um funny games came pretty close to doing that didn't they oh interesting um, i don't yeah. know if i've seen that funny game so it's um i've only seen the uh remake which is what i'm describing the original wasn't like this but Funny Games is like, it's Naomi Watts, and I can't remember who else is mm-hmm. in it, but uh, it's your standard um, couple in their house, being a couple, um, average white Americans, and then psychos break in and try to murder them, except the two killers will, when they're about to do something horrific, the film stops, and they turn to the camera, and they say, now why the fuck are you watching this? And they like address the audience directly in their fetishization of violence, and then they go back and do the horrible thing. That's fucking brilliant. Yeah. Like, I, I think there's ways of doing that, like that just does get so ridiculously mm-hmm. unsubtle, but in in a in a way that's like artistically interesting. And, um, you know, there's there's a saying that 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 uh, a good essay is just a a conversation um, editorialized. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah. and I, I feel like at some point I'm going to have to just make a piece on, on like not getting it like, yeah. like, and, and just like, where's the line? How do you get people to understand something without like ruining any sort of subtlety that's in the work? Um, another good example, I think of like works getting like brutally misunderstood by someone is, uh, uh, back when train spotting came out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are you aware of train spotting? Yeah. Um, yeah seen train spotting uh, i think I'll i was the, one of the people that didn't get it uh, <laughs> i'll do the quickest explanation for the audience yeah uh, train spotting is a piece about um a group of people struggling with drug addiction in scotland um it's discussing a lot of different elements but i'm just gonna nail in on the the drug stuff for two seconds mm-hmm. um there's a lot of other political things that like i'm not the best person to explain um but the film is about like how horrific heroin addiction is and the horrible cost it has on your life and your Mm -hmm. friendships and your people around you it is not subtle about that at all when it came out it got protested against by uh mostly like evangelical types because it was promoting drugs Mm -hmm. now i don't know about you but i think a film where characters uh die from aids due to drugs uh you know die from an overdose like it's the heavy film uh, mm-hmm. i probably should have put a content warning before saying this but I'm like sorry. it's, we'll it's do a the heavy intro. yeah if, if you want to just throw that in at the the start just like hey when we talk about train spotting we're gonna talk about some stuff um 
it shows the like the experience of withdrawal uh through some of the most uh well constructed surrealist like imagery it is a it, it's an excellent film it's quite harrowing at points i don't think I, I i genuinely cannot comprehend how you walk out of the theater after seeing that film and say this film glorifies drug usage when it is so heavily and personally about the toll that drug addiction can have yeah and also about all of the systemic elements of the political apparatuses that cause people to get into that situation. It's very clear about not blaming people who are dealing with addiction. It's uh, quite empathetic to those characters in, in a way that a lot of other media isn't. Um, it's, it's, it's a, I, I love that film, but yeah. I just, people didn't get it. And, and I think there is just a point where, um, the downside of art being subjective is that people can have really, really, really terrible readings of something um, that that just have no support within the text. And um, yeah, sometimes people don't get that, like saying that art is subjective doesn't mean that there isn't um, lesser or greater value in a reading. Um, I'm currently working up. I guess we'll get into the yeah, yeah I was gonna say this is a, a really uh this is a really good segue point to talk about your other work, <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm currently working on the second episode of unintentionally queer. I'm actually editing it like I, I stopped editing to to come do this interview um oh, thank you uh, which i'm I'm excited to do this interview but but um the first piece was on um I like making art that says it's one thing and then it's actually like other stuff on top of it mm -hmm. it's not uh, I, it's not a conscious thing it's just something i noticed like after writing so many scripts um including ones that are are complete but i haven't like i i sometimes i'll finish something and i'll leave it for a while and i'll come back to it and rewrite it and get and when i'm happy with it is when i've done that but um like i have a piece on on garth Marenghi's dark place that i realized i wanted to do some other stuff with it and so i've kind of left it on the sidelines mm -hmm. um but most of it was written like five months ago. Uh, I originally wrote the the uh, my second most recent video, Doom, uh, on the on the Doom remakes and and how we engage with um, art to deal with with complex negative emotions. Uh, I I wrote that one, I think, immediately after or in the middle of editing my first video. It was complete. Like it was a complete oh. video. I but I was just not happy with it. And uh, hmm. and the reason I wasn't happy with it is it didn't have a message. Like right. the analysis of the game was good. Like I didn't really change much. I just added some other paragraphs and some more intentionality to the entire work. Like the entire ending is it was was written the month that I shot it. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. So. Uh, Back to Unintentionally Queer. Um, the first one is on is on Tron Tron Legacy, and it's it's a queer reading of the film um, with a lot of heavy support from the text. I I did. It's just not it's not just arbitrary. I chose that one because I have a very specific relationship with that work. But it's also about a piece. It's also a piece about like how and and why queer people read ourselves into works that aren't explicitly queer. And why explicit representation is so important. Um, and it's funny because when I when I envisioned the script before mm -hmm. I had rewatched the film, I hadn't rewatched in a long time. I expected the video to be twenty one minutes long ish, and I'm usually pretty pretty good at guessing script length. Um, where I probably have like five to six minutes of just like here's the stuff that I read into it, like, and then and then most of it was going to be talking about like why we need actual explicit representation and, and all the stuff that's at the end. Um, <clears throat> and then I watched the film. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, the video is 51 minutes long um, <clears throat> and it's not wasting time. I cut it down as much as I possibly could without losing any information. Um, it's 52 minutes on my Patreon because copyright sucks. and. Mm -hmm. Even using stuff in fair use, Disney's pretty strict. I had to cut out some stuff. I kind of had to brutalize the edit. There's some spots where you'll like, there's like stock footage in place of a shot from the film because I couldn't make it work um, mm -hmm. in the YouTube edit. So that was sad. And there's like some important quotes that I couldn't use in full and that sort of thing. 
I basically spent like a week and a half re-editing it consistently that sucks. Like over and over and over and over and over again until YouTube would let it on the platform. But I'm happy with that one. That was good. And now I'm working on on um, a piece on uh, <clears throat> the 2009 miniseries Alice. Uh, I did not and... see that. Um, oh, that's part of why I chose it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is is my hope is that um, not too many people have seen it, which mm -hmm. isn't a hard thing to <clears throat> to show. But it's also discussing uh, the Alice's heteronormative lens that most people apply to media and to the world at large, and uh, you know what male gaze is and what queer gaze is, and how we read media. I'm trying to remember how we got here because I, I was talking to about Alice. Something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was talking about something and we segued into the um, uh... We were talking about um, the subjectivity of art and Right, how... right, 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 right. And the validity of, of readings. Sorry. Yes. So um, in the script, I'm actually going to pull it up because I, I, I don't... I, uh, when you write stuff, sometimes you write things way better than, than if you try to go off the cuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, where is it? Oh, uh... I had no idea this existed. I'm looking at the IMDb. IMDb oh, it's, it's a right wild now. cast. It's a wild cast. Um, oh, this is this looks. I'll, actually, I'll I'm a huge. <laughs> I'm a huge at, like a uh, Lewis Carroll Alice in Wonderland nerd. I I can't believe I didn't oh, know nice. this existed. Well, then you'll find this one really interesting because it's yeah. my personal favorite version. Um, but in the script, I say uh, not all media, when a queer lens is applied to it, will have anything to say. Not all lenses are useful in all contexts, and um, <clears throat> like you could try to do, um a queer reading of say some of the male gaze films that I talk about, like mm -hmm. transformers. You could try to do a queer reading of transformers. There's no fucking support in the text. Uh, there, there is some like homophobic homoeroticism at points, right. but like, I don't think applying that lens to that film would give any value. Uh, it right. doesn't do anything. It isn't an interesting reading. Just because you can read something as something doesn't, I mean, it's a it's a well constructed reading is probably the right word wording to use, mm -hmm. and um, whereas the media that that I choose for these, um, like I'm going to spoil a little bit of the, the thing, but I just I think talking about Alice's heteronormativity is so important. Um, is is specifically like it's not you know looking for stereotypes. It's it's about media that metaphorically represents queer experiences or allegorically does so um depending on your definition of allegory a bunch of people have disagreements about it i mean the traditional original definition is is more just like an extended metaphor that that permeates a work um and it doesn't require intentionality some people argue it does require intentionality um tolkien was really 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 hard on to and allegory must have you know um author's intent I, I think i think his exact few words were something like uh like it's the sole and complete purview of the author or something like that um let's go find the quote i i do have that quote somewhere i just yeah but the point being <laughs> um i if if you're gonna get angry at me using allegory the metaphor does fine the point is there are <laughs> there are things that we tend to read ourselves into because of the ways that the story and the story beats and things resemble life experiences that are queer. Okay, so we had some technical difficulties, um, but we're back. Uh, I believe, Aranok, before we got interrupted, you were saying that... Uh, something about subjectivity and yeah. finding yourself in media yeah yeah and i, I was just i i, I think Ross, the, the point i was making is just that um just because because you know media is subjective doesn't mean that all you know readings have value or support within text you have to kind of make an argument for it and um like you know, I gave some examples of like really bad readings of Verhoeven's work, but I also just like, like yes, I read queer metaphor into very specific media, um, but that's only because there's <laughs> the the vibes are there in the text, the the support is there in the text, and and I 
I lay out quite, you know, explicitly the arguments for like what, what, like where that reading is coming from, what what aspects are reading into that. Um, and I'm not the only yeah. person to do this. I actually have a set of videos that I, I sh- I'm going to shout out at the end of, of this um, essay that are really, really great. Um, some are from friends of mine. Uh, you know, some are from just people whose, whose work I admire. But um, it's actually one of those videos is is by uh, my chaos twin, Lady Night the Brave, uh, which... Uh, she also played a huge part in the Alice video, both being made and and uh, and a bunch of other things. Because um, OK loves loves the 2009 miniseries Alice, and we watched it together. And then afterwards, she was saying like, someone she's like, I really wish someone would make an essay on this. I just don't want to have to be the one to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, we just spent the last like three hours pointing out all of this like queer subtext and stuff. I, I could just do an unintentionally queer on it. Like, uh, and, and this is, uh, I think a half a month. Before, like I, I, I knew I was going to work on Tron legacy at the time. So I was either just starting work on it or had the script half done somewhere around there. Um, cause that was five months ago. Um, and then, yeah, every time we've been on a voice call, <laughs> she's, she's been like, do it. <laughs> Yeah. So there's there's actually a joke on the video of that, I'm, I'm including a, a screenshot of of her sending the message, "Do it, fucker." <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, well, hey, the, I the mean, sometimes being, that's what you need. Point being that I wasn't even the one that that started like reading this work that way. Um, and and she did a video on on the Pacific Rim films that's wonderful, but also like those films, <laughs> yeah, especially the second one in Uprising when when John Boyega's character can't uh, stop talking about how uh, I can't remember his name, but Clint Eastwood's son, who was in the film, uh, as a, as, yeah, as a I don't character, even how, think how those movies are like unintentionally queer. Like, no, it's, it's a little more than, pretty... than it's a little explicit <laughs> yeah. at times. Yeah. Like it's, it's still a metaphor and allegory and stuff, but it's, it's right on the surface. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and the two doctors and anyway, um, but, but yeah, and like I'm planning on doing one on um one for my cousin on on the Lego Batman film, um which if you haven't seen Lego Batman, it's kind of this like inverse romance movie about the Joker and Batman, um but it's also about like queer chosen family like really explicitly mm. there's there's a lot of stuff in it that like is isn't subtle like. Uh, like we we even get this thing of of um because because Bruce lies about being Batman to Robin, uh, Robin thinks that he has two dads and is really excited about that. <laughs> like it's not it's not subtle about the like queer undertones, but clearly they couldn't just say this is queer. Um, and I mean the, the Batman comics have been uh rife with queer subtext. Uh, to the point that like anti queer activists back in like the fifties, um, wanted like 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 part of the reason that the the comics code authority became a thing was was because of how like how obviously queer Batman and Robin were <laughs> like it's so it's quite funny because because it it touches on that quite a bit um, but there's even it's even like weird stuff like uh. There's this moment, this big emotional moment where where Batman, um, you know, accepts his chosen family uh, and and has like like bat signals for each of them. And they pop up in the pan flag colors. Uh, And I'm like. These writers knew (laughs) like there's no way that they they pick blue, yellow, pink in that order with all of this other queer subtext that's going on that it wasn't just a little bit purposeful. Yeah. Um, I, I do like, uh, I like the, uh, the series that you do because it uh, now not, maybe not Lego Batman. Cause that sounds quite intentional, but the, you're, you're oh. pulling like these, and, and you talk about this directly in Tron legacy where you're pulling mm-hmm. representation out of something that, 
may not necessarily be there, but you found yourself in it and it appealed to you personally and how important that was for mm -hmm. you. Um, and I, just, I think that's a really interesting yeah. thing and it's really enjoyable to watch. And and I should explain that. So I kind of I kind of see the at least the first bit is kind of like a a, a season, and mm -hmm. um, where I'm going to move through talking about different levels of intentionality. So when I get to Lego Batman, it's it's sitting in this weird nebulous space between intentional and unintentional. Like mm -hmm. clearly, creative people involved in the work intended queer meaning in it, but there's no explicit queer meaning, and that's probably due to studio interference and things. So I, I want to talk a little bit about, about the ways that like in the first two, I'm very much talking about like the ways that queer people read themselves into media. And then mm -hmm. the, the later ones I'm going to talk about, especially with the Lego Batman movie, I'm going to talk about Batman more broadly and stuff of the ways that queer people inserted ourselves into media without being um, explicit about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about explicitly queer media. So, so the, those okay, this get the kind of middle ones um are going to be like the un is going to be in brackets <laughs> instead of it being the the full <laughs> word because it's kind of like, well, we know there are intentional aspects, but is it all intentional? We can't tell, and it's kind of in this weird space. Whereas, like, um, when I get to explicitly queer, I want to talk about like transversive um queer musicians particularly mm. and i'm probably going to talk through a history of that that'll end with like discussing little nas's uh, little nas x in the modern day and like the way that that he's continuing a lot of work that was done over the last 50 60 years by um so many different artists from you know prince and bowie and queen and elton john um to now where we have we have works like little nas x who gets to be so explicit about his queerness um mm -hmm. in an aggressively you know anti-assimilationist manner i mean every time people get angry at him he just goes oh make it gayer <laughs> it's <laughs> like and he said those words like that's not even me reading into this it's it's so explicitly angrily queer in a way yeah. that just refuses to be toned down and um i love that and i i i I strive to make art about queerness that is um, transgressive in that way, um, yeah. in, in my own way, um, right. because, yeah, like it's gonna sound weird, but but I, I you know, my my coming out video, there are certain choices and things that I made in it that are very transgressive, but they're not like on the surface of it that way. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people mistake edginess and uh, like like transgressiveness as being edginess it's, they're not the same thing like right. south park's obnoxiously edgy, edgy but like a lot of a lot of trans artists will be transgressive they'll make art that is discomforting to a degree in very specific ways um because our existence is quite often discomforting because of the society we're in so right. um relating to us requires relating to to some of that element of of being discomforted within general society and is so much of the discussion of transness is dominated by the discussion of dysphoria and mm. of the negative aspects and it kind of doesn't it's a very cis uh mm -hmm. perspective on it because it views us as as trauma porn as um and i don't use the term porn arbitrarily i, I do mean very specifically it is it is about um fetishizing our pain mm -hmm. while in, not engaging with any other aspects of our life um and not engaging with us as full people it's like it's a very liberal thing to do the, the sort of like like oh look at you mm -hmm. oh, things must be so hard <laughs> <laughs> must be so difficult and well, it's like and okay, if you that's... i'm sorry go ahead no 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 no, no. uh please well, i was gonna say if you if you frame it in that way um number one i think it makes it more palatable to a broader audience that mm -hmm. you're trying to sell it to and two uh if you 
don't frame it in that way, then there's no room for the uh, cis hero to provide palliative care to the suffering of somebody who is, right? It, it ceases <laughs> to be a story about a trans person. It becomes a story about Michelle Pfeiffer saving the ghetto. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a, a general concept that that pops up a lot in in various um, forms of of media about allies, where mm-hmm. it becomes a savior trope. Um, you see this all over the place. The the cis savior is a common one, but also like the, the white savior is probably even more common in in art. Um, I would recommend that people go and look at uh, FT Signifier's work, um, specifically his most recent video on allyship. It's a really really good piece, um, and I think that it it applies. He's very specifically talking about the black experience in America um, and and allyship uh, and and the ways that white people are at, are good and bad allies um, and the way that media presents <clears throat> presents allies and um, yeah no and it just it certain aspects of it and he does point this out in the video as well just just apply to allyship in general um, as a disabled person and as a trans person there is a lot of um, overlay and outside dynamics or interactions between privileged and marginalized that mm-hmm. are interesting. Um, I'm going to come back to this in two seconds for that, that little thing there. But uh, yeah, the, the sort of cis savior thing is, is I think really, really core to how a lot of cis people engage with, with media about trans people. And I say media about trans people because quite often it's not trans media. Like a lot of these things, you know, they have a cis person playing the character. It's very obsessed. Hey, trauma of being trans must be so horrible. That doesn't get the point that being trans is fucking wonderful. Being trans in a cis normative society sucks. Got nothing to do with me. <laughs> got nothing to do with what I am. Got everything to do with everybody else being shit to me. And right. and he talks to enough trans people. That's a pretty common sentence. <laughs> like yeah. I am. I am not saying anything new with that sentence. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately for a lot of people, it is a new thing to hear. And right. that first work, um, I didn't want it to be like sickening faux sweet either, which I think is another thing that some people go into a little bit deeply. Is it's <clears throat> I wanted it to be genuine about the experience. I wanted to um, touch on that pain, yes specifically so i can get people to understand that that being trans is is about euphoria it's about that feeling of being yourself it is an overwhelmingly powerfully positive experience and um not being that is torture and that part sucks but it's not i don't define myself by that pain and i don't want other people to define me by that pain and i want people to understand that you can be trans and not have dysphoria and you can be trans and you know not have experienced some arbitrary level of of bigotry um for you to be valid and i say that as someone i have experienced a lot of violence in my life for what i am um i've been through a lot of violence you know um i'm very very lucky that my immediate family is very supportive but uh my school experience was extremely negative and a lot of other experiences interpersonally were quite um yeah the, the, <laughs> i'm not going to talk specifics that's that's my own right. personal baggage but Understanding that I'm trans, getting to be myself has been the best part of my life. And I just wanted to get across how wonderful and amazing euphoria is and how it's about getting to be yourself. Because I think so often the cis lens is that trans people are trans because we feel discomfort, pain, etc. Um, when viewed as cis. Mm. Um, but that's not really accurate. Like, 
trans people are trans because because of that euphoria, because we know that's right, that it's us, that that it's who we are. And um that that other thing is 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 very much from the external. Um the the term dysphoria even is is an like in in some ways um an an othering term created by cis people to pathologize transness um because there is a more broad term um that applies to anyone that that, that misattunement you know mm-hmm. um uh the the disconnect between external views of of what you are what you physic who you are that sort of thing and and who you actually are and that um occurs within cis people too but it doesn't get pathologized in that way because um because there isn't that that need to other um i think um like and i think all of that kind of comes through in your work uh what what i took away from those videos was very much what you were saying is that the subjective experience of being trans is not painful in and of itself that it is actually one of joy and being yourself and Mm -hmm. that the pain where it exists comes from living in a society that does not value your experience and tries to force you to be something other than what you are um Mm -hmm. and that i i I think that that's a it's unfortunate that that the cis lens kind of tries to make the story about pain because i think that that experience of not being valued for what you innately are uh that thing that brings you joy by yourself is actually something that a great many people could identify with trans or not and And yeah that's a really good place to segue into something i want to talk about um uh is i think a lot of cis people are discomforted by the fact that the trans experiences are actually pretty relatable. <laughs> and, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you want a really good example of that <laughs> with current discourse, uh, the trailer for the new Matrix film just released, mm-hmm. and obviously trans people in general are pretty excited uh, because the original Matrix trilogy is very important to the trans community. It's a trans allegory. Um, if you want a really good piece about that i would recommend um uh eric sophia and uh sarah zedig's uh video the matrix sequels are good actually um but uh yeah so that's actually those videos are where i learned that it was an explicit trans allegory actually because i Mm -hmm. I had been of the mind that it was unintentional on their part, and then I watched uh, Curio's video and was like, "Oh, I didn't know that they had stated that it was explicitly." Oh, they, they've one. stated it many, many yeah. times, but but again, it's that that downplaying of the trans perspective yeah. on on trans art by the trans right. artists that made it. <laughs> like, like, it's not just the downplaying of the trans community's view of the mm. the works. Um, so so I've been very frustrated dealing with 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 a lot of cis people who have been to to make themselves more comfortable trying mm-hmm. to actively downplay trans voices about those works right on the other hand there's been another group that have been really obnoxious which um hey this is me calling in on my own (laughs) other white queer people stop getting mad at people of color talking about the racism of the wachowskis (laughs) holy shit (laughs) i want to be clear i'm not the person to explain that stuff and i'm gonna um i'm gonna have mark put in Mm -hmm. um some threads from some really really wonderful people it'll be in the the down there part it'll be in the down there part um but i have noticed that clearly because not enough white queer people are backing up those voices and promoting those voices cis people have been going and 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 other white trans people have been trying to say that oh it's it's just it's just cis people getting like mad at the trans directors or whatever and it's it's, it's trans misogyny and i just i i, I so in the film Cloud Atlas, <laughs> the Wachowskis did yellow face. That's just a thing that happened. I, it's so blatantly racist that it's not even funny. Like, you can look up the images. It, I, and yeah, there's other stuff that um, uh, Indiana Tan specifically covers in, um, in his threads that, that, that'll be linked. But th- the point is, 
the the Wachowskis made films that matter a lot to trans people. Cis people downplaying that is really, really harmful in some ways. At the same time, we also need to acknowledge that the Wachowskis are not perfect people, that they've done some really hor horrible stuff with their art and, and also in the, in the real world um, with, with statements they have made. And I think a lot of people have this very strange, very damaging, very limiting under I idea that, that art needs to be perfect to be allowed to like it. Mm -hmm. And the problem with this concept is it does not lead to critiques of the problematic elements of art. What it leads to is the defense of problematic art, because if it's problematic, then you're not allowed to like it because of this weird idea that you can only like perfect art. It's so that is probably a perfect <laughs> encapsulation of the problem that the right wants to call cancel culture. But mm -hmm. um, no, that's actually very, very beautifully said. And I'm going to clip that and I'm going to stick it on <laughs> a pillow. Um. <laughs> no, but, but like um, in my video on Tron Legacy, which uh -huh. is one of my favorite fucking films of all time. So you cannot do this like, they're not so to cancel Tron Legacy. <laughs> I have like an eight minute piece about problems in that film about its sexism about um some some vaguely racist shit that that is in the film that like do i think the people making the film are evil people god fucking no do i think that the biases in society result in people making art with problematic messaging or moments in it that aren't good yes and i don't think that liking the parts that i like about that film discredits or or means that I agree with the problematic elements. It's this weird concept of uh, I, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna call it like encapsulation, where it's just the idea that like if you if you agree with statement A by person Y, you must also agree with all other statements by person Y, which is fucking ridiculous. Yeah. I guarantee you, I can find a quote from like Trump or Jordan Peterson or someone else that I despise at a core level that I agree with. Probably something a name like I like chocolate ice cream, but like, <laughs> but like, Jordan Peterson liking chocolate ice cream has fuck all to do with him being a transphobic asshat, <laughs> yeah. and and me agreeing that I like chocolate ice cream too, it's good, it has nothing to do with me also disagreeing with those other statements, and the same goes with a piece of art. I can like the way that, that Sam and Cora interact in a lot of scenes, I can like a lot of things. And I can also really dislike the film is at times quite sexist in the way that it gives, um, or not, it doesn't give autonomy to a lot of the women in the film. Uh, the way that, that certain women are shot at times, there's very, very male gaze, um, not like not Cora, but, but there are some side characters that are like really obvious male gaze. <laughs> and, I, I can dislike the way that the the stereotype taxi driver um, who is who is clearly like from India and is speaking in like an obvious accent and it's kind of not a great stereotype. I can dislike that. And that has nothing to do with like my enjoyment of. Uh, the, the 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 dad character, you know, coming over his, his toxic masculinity to understand his his kid more. Like th yeah. they have nothing to do with each other. Like I can, yeah. I can like these parts and dislike these parts at the same time. And it's not a contradiction. And this idea that like, I think it's, it's the inherency argument. I think yeah. some, so many people are brought up in a Christian culture, a specifically Christian culture that has like two core concepts, which is this inherent good or evil, right. Mm -hmm. And a punishment complex. And the second one is where a lot of the idea of the, the, the myth of, cancel culture kind of comes out of is a lot of people presume that everyone else is seeking to punish mm -hmm. and a lot of people presume that everyone else is thinking along the lines of someone's inherently good or evil when i say the wachowskis have done this racist shit my statement isn't the wachowskis are the devil we must cast them into the fire and punish them no <laughs> my my statement is acknowledging that like that, that that bias has an effect on the media they make, that we need to be critical of the media they make because of that, that we need to examine our relationship to that media to make sure that we're not recreating or agreeing with those types of statements, and that um, 
you know, in an ideal world, they would self-examine, reconsider, and apologize for for those things. I think the best thing you can do when you make a mistake, because you're human, you're gonna make a mistake. If you don't think you can make a mistake, you've already made like the worst mistake you can, um, which is deep narcissism of just uh, that. Actually, that's a bad term that fits into some areas. Deep self focus that specifically relies on the idea of you must be inherently good because no one is inherently good or bad. People take actions. Those actions have an effect on the world and the people around you. And sometimes the actions and words you take are harmful and that needs to be acknowledged. And I just think that it's easy. It's easy to go the Christian route of saying, Sorry, my cats. I love and, cats. Uh, no, it's the very cute. <laughs> I've been trying not to get distracted by the cat in the background. Yeah, so... <laughs> it's so cute. Um, I, I, but as I was saying, I think it's very, very easy to sit down and go, you know, X person's inherently good. Y mm-hmm. person's inherently evil. And that's the end of the conversation. Because inherency requires no accountability. It requires no change. Right? Um, and it lets you just hate someone like, and I, I just, I don't hate the Wachowskis. I hate that they've said racist shit. I hate, I hate the actions they took, you know? Um, there are very, very few people where I would say the word hate applies for me and, uh, newsflash, all of them want marginalized people dead. So like, (laughs) I think I'm justified. (laughs) Yeah. And, and but but I also want to be clear that like people do change. I've seen it in my life. Like that 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 is a that is a. I I hate them in the moment for the things that they're doing, you know. But not. not I just hate this inherency bullshit. I think it's a completely useless way of engaging with the world. No, like, I, 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 I I agree completely. What yeah. What do you get out of this? You know. Well, I think. Well, I mean, you you summed it up very I, I, well. The, it, other than like the easiness, but I just mean like in the long term as a society, as a group of people, as like as a friend group, even or even in your family, like engaging with stuff like that. Yeah, all it leads to is more harm. Yeah, it's it's largely completely unproductive. I'm sure that there is probably not to get all like Evo psych or anything, <laughs> but like I'm no, sure it. like it it obviously <laughs> has. It's something we all do and are all susceptible to, and the internet has only magnified, you know, our tendency to behave in that way. And I don't know if it's like a, because I, I mean, I don't spend a lot of time on non-English Twitter because all I speak is English and bad English, but <laughs> I, I have a hard time believing that that is a cultural phenomenon specific to the Anglosphere. Um, and it may very well be, mm-hmm. I could be wrong about that, but it I, strikes me. I don't me- think it is. Yeah. But I do think that, like, it is important to examine the way that, like, religious beliefs underlie mm-hmm. a lot of things. And and Christianity is such a pervasive yeah. global force that it isn't it isn't just here. I've had, um, y- you know, conversations with a, a professor of economics uh, that I took a class from two or three summers ago. Um, he's originally from Nigeria, and he left because he was so fed up with with certain aspects of their, like, heavily Christian, very homophobic uh culture that he was interacting with that came from christian colonization um mm-hmm. like I, I i think uh you know as like it's the meme haha everything's bad because of colonization and capitalism but yes actually <laughs> the yeah. the underlying systems we live in inform the way we all behave and yeah. like i i think when when you start to genuinely listen to religious belief systems outside of um, Christian ones, um, you'll notice that there's a very different pattern of belief around like like death and life. And, and the problem is that a lot of times people's conceptions of, say, Judaism or Islam or Taoism or Hinduism are, are based on a Christian understanding of, of religion. Um, if you want really a good examples of this, go look at like any anti-theist. There's a big difference between an anti-theist and an atheist. An atheist just doesn't believe in a god or whatever. An anti-theist is someone who like 
actively as a knob end to anyone that has <laughs> religious beliefs and is like proselytizing in the other direction. Mm-hmm. Um, which is kind of missing the whole point of like, if you don't like proselytizing, don't go and do it yourself. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but but a lot of uh, a lot of the um, anti theist types are are generally viewed as is Christian atheists. Their fundamental worldview was built by Christianity. That's what they grew up in. And they have a hard time seeing that there are religious structures completely outside of their own. Um, like, I, I think Christians have a really, really hard time, especially um, understanding like in, indigenous belief systems mm-hmm. and relationships to the land mm-hmm. because it is so foreign to the Christian construction of, of the universe. Yeah. Um, or modern Christian, like it's it's Christianity's changed so much over time. I mean, it's been problematic in this way for a very very long time. But like, you can actually track the sort of interrelationship between the way that like Christianity became the sort of hierarchical system with its relationship to empires, particularly mm-hmm. the Roman Empire first, and then its colonization of of a lot of Europe, um, and then the way that just kind of kept going out and out. Um, yeah, to bring one us back of my. Around uh... to, like one of my uh well the first thing that i did when i created a youtube channel um was i was actually going to make a series on the history of philosophical thoughts surrounding abortion Mm -hmm. and so i went back like soup to nuts all the way to aristotle and the uh (laughs) early uh to the stoics to the stoic influence on early christendom in rome and how eventually that led into what is basically a cult of virginity um and it's actually just a Mm -hmm. like the the journey of (laughs) christendom into this this um superstructure of just disdain for nuance and all the fun things too and that's a bad combination like it... oh yeah <laughs> and it's 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 understanding like how specifically christian a lot of those things are um that like there there are there are sects of other religions that are just like christianity but with the book changed out but like all the beliefs are kind of fundamentally still like following the christian model where it's like this complete bastardization and, and misunderstanding of those other um religions by like ex Christians and stuff. Um I'm not the person to talk on it, but um I've had Jewish friends to me of, of mine talk about like the weird like like spin off thing that like Christians tried to do to like get Jew- Jews to leave Judaism and <laughs> join this like Judaism but we believe in Christ thing and it's this really obnoxious sort of proselytizing that like doesn't understand Judaism at, at its foundation. Um also, an important aspect of other religions, like, I, I think a lot of Christian people can get that there's a lot of divides in Christianity, but they group all of Judaism or all of Islam as one thing and then take the worst example possible um, and, and say that that's representative of the entire belief structure. And it just isn't. Like, there's so many divisions because there are so many different um, beliefs that are built off of the same um, religion. and. I, I think it is it is very effective and very harmful propaganda that has created that mentality of like Judaism is one thing. It's not at all. There's constant disagreement. You know anything about rabbis? They're constantly arguing with each other about meaning and purpose and all these different stuff. Um, and same goes for Islam. And it's just very clear to me, like like when when dealing with anti-theists and stuff, that they've never talked to a Jewish person or talked to a Muslim person beyond attempting to proselytize with them. Yeah. It's a one directional conversation. It's really, really unfortunate. Um, coming back to the Christian thing though, for some some interesting insight, like it it is fascinating how much different systems are interrelated with each other. Um, most people wouldn't realize this because it's so heavily covered and not discussed in um, <laughs> um not discussed in in schools and things is that the first documentation of non-binary people goes back to ancient Mesopotamia. Um, there's some stuff that, that would indicate that there's earlier things, but like writing, like if we want to talk writing, no oral history, just writing. Um, there are early, early, early myths and an actual historical documents about non-binary people from that time period. Um, which, um, which culture? 
Mesopotamia specifically. Um, I'm going to look up the, the myth so I'm not yeah, misquoting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm bad at names. Because to give you an idea of how far I went back on that uh, yeah, abortion uh, thing, I read so the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh and the Code of Hammurabi. <laughs> yeah, so uh, there, there's a specific tale from uh, th th that's about Ishtar. And okay. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And basically, um, th there's a bunch of early non binary gods in various religions. Like, it. If if there is recorded history at the time, you can find some instance of a culture with uh, explicitly um, queer. Like again, we're using modern terms that are like the closest to it. Like uh, in the case of the Ishtar story, I believe it's just like a third gender, like whatever their term for that was. And mm -hmm. um, the the idea of of like a rigid binary gender system um, only really starts coming about later um, in that sort of hard rules kind of way. Um, it, and it really, really spread when, um, when the interrelationship of like specific beliefs from Greece mixed with Christianity, mixed with the Roman empire spread it outwards. Um, if you look at a lot of, European cultures pre um pre Roman imperial influence or pre uh Christian empires plural because it depends which time period we're talking about there's many many different cultures but eventually all of them got got this treatment in some way <laughs> um their relationship to gender was a lot more complicated now to be clear that doesn't mean that it like didn't have problematic aspects or wasn't patriarchal um there's there's quite a few Norse um cultures that had like an emphasis on masculinity as, as superior but there wasn't a two gender system there wasn't like the, the modern conception and it wasn't as um sex based which is why there was so many you know instances of of archaeologists who are coming from this modern lens of binary gender systems that would go like a woman who was a warrior and <laughs> buried like a man that can't be because because all they all they had was like like uh you know, weaker archaeological equipment that couldn't get them to test things like 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 bone marrow genetics and stuff that that gave them like, oh, this this person was buried with all of the implements that we traditionally connect with a specific like masculine gender of warrior, um, and they just presumed that uh that that meant that the person's biology was something specific. Um, the the thing is, what what annoys me is that. It is very likely that those are all men, right? Like that 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 that's how they identified gender wise. That's why they were buried that way, that they performed that role and purpose in their society. And by calling them women, it's ignoring their autonomy with gender. And likewise, there's instances of people being buried in a in a way that would be traditionally considered for a woman whose uh genetic makeup isn't what we connect with being a woman um in in a cis normative society and it's it's one of those things where it's it's been this slow reclamation of history um over time of being more accurate to the actual cultures at the time and their more complex views of gender um but in a more con like a more more uh you know modern context most um indigenous cultures that have been colonized over the last a thousand years or so by by europe um had uh third gender or or gender fluidity or um often both um you, you, you know so, um, views and, and understandings of gender that, that are much more closer to the sort of modern queer I'm, context i'm vaguely familiar with uh what is it the two spirit was one yeah. of them um and so i would highly recommend that people look up and go and listen to because i'm not the person to to explain those things I, I would much prefer that you look into those cultures it's more just that i want people to be aware of the the historical context that mm -hmm. like fundamentally the idea of the binary gender system the the idea of like punishment in the christian way um these things are constructs they were enforced by a culture and and a and a purpose and people with certain like power that they wanted to hold on to and um i i think it's easy to fall into this idea that they're inherent views or that like it's natural 
um because what's viewed as natural is uh sort of bumping the mic uh what's viewed as natural is in the end uh defined by society mm-hmm. it's a socio political definition that evolves and changes what was viewed as natural 100 years ago is drastically different than now let alone a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago or 3000 years ago right um and again i think it's just about getting people to as i've been trying to do with my work question the lenses they view things through mm-hmm. and engage with the fact that they do view things through a lens yeah um well and I, I think you do it very well um i actually wanted to get your opinion on a one piece of media that uh hmm. i have uh thought for years that though the author would probably roll over in their grave um uh, i really want to see the next iteration of dune uh be given to a trans person to do um, hmm. because the nature of the central character, the Kwisatz Haderach, admits of a trans reading that I don't think uh, it has been given. Um, do you have any thoughts that on that? That is fascinating. So are and you I'm familiar with the story? I didn't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so for context, um, I'm a big old Dune nerd. I okay. love those books. I read them when I was like 12 or 13 for the first time. And I... I acknowledgments out of the way it's got some problematic elements in it that came from a a white american who wasn't very culturally sensitive to um people of the middle east in particular but i do think that there is a lot of misconceptions about what dune is Mm -hmm. um and what it's trying to say when we talk about earlier like the the like readings that are bad but come from projection from like like a very specific type of person (laughs) right wingers um Dune is about a protagonist who is a villain. Mm-hmm. You are not supposed to like Paul. Paul is a bad person. Paul spends the entire rest of the second and third book talking about how horrible of a person he is. Like like the 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 immensity of his regret mm-hmm. is the like central aspect of the second and third book in a lot of ways. Yeah. So if you just read Dune it doesn't get that across enough. And that's when we talk about that, like getting unsubtle, Frank Herbert got unsubtle with the second and third book because he was like, holy shit, guys, you're not supposed to think that like what Paul did was good. Now here's a part of the reading of Dune. That's really important. And a lot of people don't know about this. And I actually learned this from a video by movies with Mikey, who does great work. Frank Herbert was related to, um, red scare president, uh, not president. Um, my brain's doing McCarthy. So Frank Herbert was related to McCarthy. Really? Most people don't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. McCarthy, I think, was either, I think it was his husband to his sister, like his brother-in-law or his cousin's husband. Anyway, he knew McCarthy. When you have that context and you look at the story of Dune from the political standpoint of Frank Herbert, who did not like McCarthy's <laughs> political viewpoint, it gets an interesting context. Yeah, no, because I... when you look at it, it's about someone setting off, uh, you, you know, who is trying to achieve certain personal goals that sets off a a like massive thing that he didn't expect to happen that results in many, 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 many people being killed and wiped out. Um, yeah, that that uh, <laughs> I did not know that that colors the story a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Which is a wild thing, but um, I, I really need to reread Dune um, yeah. before the movie comes out. I'm excited to go see it. I, yeah, I was same. considering if I get inspired, I'm going to rewatch it. I might do a video on why I think the um, the Dune miniseries is actually a pretty good adaption. I, I think but it's the superior adaption. It's the superior adaption, and I think it's interesting. And I might I might try to talk about like uh why dune fails to get across that it's about critiquing the idea of like a white savior or the the hero's journey because it's like it's about why that's bad (laughs) like paul ruins all of these people that he cares about constantly and and 
and even in the first book there's just constant like i mean again i think it i think it fails because it is very much coming from this like oh woe is me i'm gonna keep doing it anyway <laughs> like, yeah. well, and the... it never it never like punishes him for it which is the traditional structure to like get that point across well, the, the force of uh destiny does a lot of heavy lifting in that book um yeah where it's like i really don't want to be doing this but like it's what i do uh i, I don't <laughs> like and if it's i try like, not to do it i'm just gonna do it harder so uh, it's, yeah it's it's sort of this inevitability thing that it's going for um wait. Uh, uh, yeah like it's the sort of thing of like well you fucked up and now you can't you know take it back like yeah. you can't undo what you've decided to do. You decided to go on this path of vengeance and and of of war and and suffering, and and in so doing, you've damaged this culture that that you have appropriated. Uh, you it have ultimately annihilates it, and part of ultimately annihilates it, it destroys their culture, um, destroys a way of life, destroys most of the structure of the universe, uh, wipes out billions of people. Like, if you want to argue that Paul is good. Um, I highly recommend you read Children of Dune and Dune Messiah and yeah. come back to me after reading those and tell me that Frank Herbert's, you know, or, or the text is explicitly supportive of, of Paul. I think that's a hard argument to make. I think a good argument to make, though, and, and one that I think, think needs to be said is that it fundamentally fails to fully critique aspects because it's too obsessed with the cis like white man's perspective mm -hmm. at the core of it and um it it it's almost scared to fully engage with the idea of like paul just made those decisions and that was wrong like it wants to say that and then it kind of goes like but it's inevitable and you're like well yeah. you're so close to really good critique <laughs> <laughs> you're this close and i think the later the later books do a better job of expanding on that and, and and giving it that full context of like yes actually paul wrong um but and then but god emperor two... goes back and undoes all the criticism uh kind of kind of yeah it yeah. gets messy I, yeah. I would recommend reading to the end of children of dune and not touching the series after that because <laughs> i I liked the books through that. I don't know. I've, yeah. I haven't read them in a long time, and I'm sure they're very tainted by the memory, uh, like 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 the perspective and memory of a teenager with without much, you know, yeah, uh, personal awareness and a lot of internalized issues. <laughs> so same. Um, uh, yeah, I I read the book at, as a 15 year old, and I came away thinking mm -hmm. Paul was the hero of the story. And it wasn't until many years later that I uh, finally listened to Paul himself tell me he was not. <laughs> <laughs> and i think that's a good thing and i, I yeah. think like i i don't think it's wrong to to get that reading from that book because i as i said i think the book fails to get across what it's trying to say a lot of times um because again i think it's very very wrapped in a very specific perspective um but i think the valuable thing isn't isn't turning it into this thing of like I'm going to defend Paul no matter what. Paul's perfect. Fuck you. It's going, why do I not want to see Paul as failure, as someone who's done the wrong thing? And I remember reading, starting to read Dune Messiah, putting it down, being annoyed about it, and then coming back to it and realizing, like, part of why I didn't like that was engaging with the fact that I related to Paul and it made me discomforted mm -hmm. that that Paul was not a good person in a lot yeah. of ways. Uh, again, not the inherency thing, but just in a like the book is saying he's horrible. Like yeah. we're not. Uh, I see a lot of my most nobly motivated, ennoble characteristics in Paul, mm -hmm. and I think it's easy to do. Like uh, in many mm -hmm. ways, Paul is a mirror for uh, angry young people who want to change the world and the book itself yeah. is a lesson to why you should not always give in to those impulses and the darker things that they compel you to do um, yeah the, the the effect of zealotry and 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 pursuing a cause without uh care for the effect on the people around you um is i think so core to it um i yeah because because that 
you know, 14 as as a, uh, a an extremely self-hating closeted trans person surrounded by pretty abusive friend friend group. Um yeah, I related to being angry and spiteful and um I think in some ways that book series, not so much the first book, um but especially the later books really helped me to go maybe I have some shit views. Maybe I need to to re-examine some things. Maybe I've bought into beliefs that I've been told to believe from a young age and and those beliefs aren't healthy. And um I think that's ultimately why a lot of people coming keep coming back to Dune and caring about Dune. Um I think it's also why it 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 resonates with a lot of people of a wide selection of identities and experiences. Um yeah, so I think I you know, I'm not like discrediting the idea of it being a white savior thing. I think it's I, I think it's more accurate to say it's a failure to critique the white savior. Like yeah. it, it it's an attempt at critiquing the white savior from the perspective of someone who sees themselves as a white savior in a lot of ways. And yeah. and maybe that's that's a bit of a harsh judgment on on Frank Herbert as a writer. But um, you know, I've read things that he's written, and 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 more about himself than than his work, and I I don't think it's fully unfair yeah. um, to say. I think the uh, the meta. So, the, what what you said is is probably correct. That the book itself tries to make criticisms that the world Frank Herbert built does not allow for. So, in in everything that Paul does within the scope of the story he is effectively validated because he is within mm -hmm. the context of the story the apex of human evolution and can see the fucking future so <laughs> like I, it, I guess we have to get into the like weird eugenic shit because yeah. there's, some, there's some really weird like very of its time like hey big old content warning yeah <laughs> if you want to get into this but like frank herbert had some wacky ass ideas about genetics that are not great <laughs> that that i i would hope you don't agree with as, as an audience listening to us but like um but again i think it comes back to that like we can find value in works yeah those works can be deeply problematic and harmful yeah. um i'm a huge hp lovecraft fan so i i understand <laughs> the uh the the loving things that are problematic is tattooed on my back that phrase so like i well, and it's, it's just and but like you have to be able to criticize the things about what you mm -hmm. love to just it's it's it, uh, having that duality that you talked about where it's mm -hmm. either all good or all bad is just, just not not only is it unproductive but it's going to prevent you from one engaging with a number of works that you would find meaningful and two in the act of critiquing those works find even more meaning and things that are of value to yourself in making a critique of something you care for deeply like that mm -hmm. in and of itself is a very intimate and productive act with art i think i think if anything i i'm much more interested in critiquing and engaging with art i care about because mm -hmm. like art that i think just sucks like <laughs> i okay i can rant about it but like wh what am i getting out of that I, I do think there is art that is interesting to discuss the ways that it's problematic and how it's problematic and things to explain aspects of perspective. But I would much rather dig into the works that I attach myself to emotionally, that, that meant something to me, that, that resonated with me, because diving into that discomfort you have with a piece of media, with a critique of a piece of media, is, I think, where you find the most growth, the most value. Um, you know, as as a queer person and especially as a trans person, finding good representation is uh, <laughs> difficult, um, especially if we go historically. And with that comes, you know, works that like really, really resonate with me, that matter a lot to me, that that, that I that I strongly feel about, that have really problematic elements that that are directly affecting my identity and my experience um as as a trans person um but it's even just the ways in which 
works ignore my experiences too like that that's something that that like i'm looking at doom dune uh, dune like dune doesn't even take into account the concept of queerness in society as into its critiques and discussions of the grand scale of a society and it's like well how a society responds to queerness says a lot about that society Mm -hmm. and not even engaging with that directly while doing some kind of homophobic stuff with the Harkonnens, if I remember correctly, there's some. Oh, it was super bad. Super but gross to, to with Herbert's that. credit, uh, in the fourth book, which I actually like God Emperor, uh, even though it goes off the rails <laughs> a little bit. Um, but in I the fourth get past book. The first three par- chapters, I think that's my problem. <laughs> um, so, so in the, the story, they re and they like clone Duncan Idaho. Um, right, so you've right, got, right, right. so you've got Duncan Idaho. 10,000 years in the future sure. from the uh, original series and at one point in the book uh there's two I want to say two gay men who are doing gay stuff and Duncan Idaho is like that's disgusting and the other characters chastise him for being old fashioned so Frank Herbert actually did kind Which of Which is awesome. Evolve. Like that's cool. uh, he he got like, about as like... far as a dude born in 1930 could get. Um but but still, like that's progress, yeah. and I I think like again we're talking about a book from what nineteen sixty eight. Yeah, yeah. I think, so, I think that's correct here. Somewhere so, about there. This is not a progressive <laughs> time period in history, in a lot of ways. Yeah. With a, with a dude born in the nineteen thirties that that was very white and and very rich. Um. Yeah, I for a second there when I was saying like I like dude doesn't even engage with it, I was like oh right no there's the blatant homophobia I forgot about that. <laughs> Not even homophobia, but like hom- like the only gay character in the book is a pedophile. Oh yeah, um, like it's yeah. it's just like the oldest like anti yeah. anti gay you know card of the book. Like, it, but it's it's the, actually a lot of a lot of the Harkonnen stuff is engaging in various forms of, of bigotry because it it goes for like Frank Herbert wants to discuss the audience and the way he does that is by saying this character is fat and gay. Like that's yeah. how he, that's how he says be disgusted, and it's like, wow, okay. <laughs> so, like, like as a queer person, I hated that. That <laughs> sucked. <laughs> I still, you know, enjoy aspects of that that piece of art. Um, but it's even just like, like I've been watching Cowboy Bebop with uh with Lady Knight, um, because mm-hmm. she's prepping to to make a video on on the series and. Um, we we just watched the the Gren episodes. Uh, so oh yeah, those content, were so good. Yeah. They're great episodes. They're fucking great. I love that show. It's it's excellent. Mm-hmm. But but the creator has a very um, we're gonna say mixed bag right up into even like in the last couple of years of of queer representation. The hell of a lot more queer representation than a lot of Western works of art. But it's it's a mixed bag and um. Two characters in that series are very canonically non-binary, or at least trans. Uh, Gren is one of them. Gren has been confirmed as non-binary very, very explicitly multiple times, both back when it was being created and um, now in a more like understanding method. And and they cast a non-binary actor for the the live action version of Gren. Oh, so cool. I'm really, really excited to see what Mason Alexander Park brings to that role. But Gren's episode is like probably my favorite piece of non-binary representation from before 2010. So it's got some really problematic shit. In it. Like, like it, it treats this reveal of, of Gren's uh, body in, in this sort of like, boy, like what? And it's like, not, not a good, not a good thing. Like the, the scene is treating it in a very othering manner. That's not great, which is, heavily contrasted by the excellent dialogue there's this line from gren i want to look it up so i re- that i that i quote it correctly gren uh yeah i am both at once and neither one in response to being asked what what their gender is it's like such a beautifully explicitly non-binary um statement and sentence and the character is beautiful and presents in masculine ways and feminine ways and it's it's great but like that reveal is quite gross like mm-hmm. it's not 
a good uh scene and and you layer onto that there's this like weird thing with um with the character having been like forced onto some form of hormones while they were in prison this like weird forced femme thing that's like kind of fetishistic and weird mm. now to be clear the character isn't negatively viewed for this and doesn't have a negative view of that experience but like it is very weird um and i think it is a product of its time but i just think it's like yeah uh it, the the statement from the creator was that that he didn't really have the vocabulary yet to call the character non-binary when they made gren but um yeah so so gren's kind of a bit of a mixed bag in some ways um, and then you have Ed. Um, so Ed has been directly stated as uh, as uh, the words I, th I think it was um, their gender is irrelevant in an interview by the creator, who then proceeded to use pretty much every set of pronouns he could think of for the character for the rest of the interview on purpose to get across to the point that like Ed's gender is irrelevant to Ed. That and and so I I personally would say that that's most closely to the the sort of a gender. Um, umbrella of identities, which is just not really having a gender or not really having a, a gendered experience and feeling. Um, which, yeah, I, I like. It, it, I, I'm not kidding. Across all like major works of published fiction um, in the '90s, there are six non-binary characters. Five on the wiki, but I count Ed because of the statements from the director that have made it very clear that Ed is non-binary. But how many of those do you think were written by different people? Um, as in, like, uh... of of the six, there are six total. We got two are written by one person. There's four remaining. So I, I would really assume they were all written by the counting. same person. Uh, so two of them are written by Neil Gaiman, and the other two are by unique writers. Hmm. But that means that four of six came from two writers. <laughs> That's uh. it. Like, and, uh, like, first off, I, I, I adore a lot of Neil Gaiman's writing. Um, again, I'm talking about the work that he's done. He's not a perfect person. This idea of perfection's bullshit. We're not doing idolatry bullshit here. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying, but I, but I do appreciate a lot of Neil Gaiman's work. Um, I love the film Stardust. I love good omens as a TV show. Um, one of my favorite books it's currently in the stack of books I have my camera sitting on is uh, is Trigger Warning, uh, which is a set of short stories by Neil Gaiman. Um, to be clear, he is not trivializing that word. Uh, they're pretty heavy subject matter stories. They involve a lot of different topics um, that I, like, because I know when I saw that title, I was like, Neil, come on. <laughs> but, but, but no, he, he was actually engaging in good faith with the idea of, of triggers and, and, and clearly like trying to, it's a good it's a good it's a good short story set um if you like american gods that's one of my actually, favorite books there's a short story in there about shadow set in england that's great uh nice. it's my first introduction to american gods and um it made me want to read the book um so yeah like i like a lot of neil gaiman's work and i really appreciate that neil gaiman consistently writes in queer characters and also tries to update the way that he presents those queer characters um with time and 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 like listens to feedback from from queer people on on that writing um but yeah in in the 90s we had um Aziraphale and in in good omens both in the book and and the tv show is uh is non-binary um i don't think it's ever really explicitly stated it just is like <laughs> um which is cool yeah, yeah um, i didn't i didn't pick up on that when i read it but yeah that tracks yeah like it totally tracks the instant said it just makes total sense and yeah like, um and yeah so you've got that happening and then um desire in sandman and to bring this back around to gren from cowboy bebop who's being played by mason alexander park in the live action version guess who's playing desire in the live action version of of sandman it's mason alexander park <laughs> so um it's really it's really great to see that uh like Netflix is adapting more works um and explicitly putting in non-binary characters in that are being played by non-binary actors. I wish there was more non-binary actors getting roles. Um mm -hmm. but like 
super excited for for Mason as a performer that that they're getting to do that. They're getting to play queer roles that that match their gender identity and and um yeah, it's you know uh as I said in the Tron Legacy video, like it's it's a first step. We're really, 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 really far from good. Um yeah. Well, I think to connect it to like what we started talking about is representation is very important. And mm -hmm. if you don't have it, you'll find it because it's an instinctive human need to see yourself represented in art, particularly art that you love. And so it's mm -hmm. always a good thing when we can put uh, a plurality of human experience into the art that we present to the world. Yeah. Like, I, I'll be perfectly honest, I don't think that all queer representation needs to be well-made or good. I just think we're in such a shit place right now because there's so little of it that when it does misstep, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of cis people, those very few non-binary people that characters that exist are the only interactions they might ever have with it in media before meeting someone in, in real life and i would much rather <laughs> that they go through that process of getting that we're people uh on their own fucking time <laughs> so i don't have to babysit them <laughs> um because because it's actually been shown that that people um learn from and uh and break down bigotry when they interact with people from whatever group that they're biased towards, and that um, the same effect can be achieved with media. Yeah. Um, that is uh, actually a running theme through all of the interviews that I've done. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's come up in probably about 60% of them is... <laughs> Uh, it, we always touch at some point on cosmopolitanism, and if you can't get the real life version, then consuming media that is by and for people who are not like you uh, is one of the best ways to grow as a person and to become comfortable with the other variety of humanity that exists in this world. Yeah, it's it's developing a consciousness of other perspectives that are outside your own and understanding that they exist and mm -hmm. that, that, uh, um, while you may not perfectly understand them, um, can, you can respect them and you can learn from them. And yeah. And I, I think, you know, you know uh, to say though, I just, I would like to get to the point where I could just enjoy like shitty representation <laughs> and not feel the need to like, fuck, gotta talk about this. Like, <laughs> Be because, um, yeah, I mean, there's like six ace characters in movies. I think like 20 non-binary characters in, in all of cinema history. Like, <laughs> that's that's pretty shit. Yeah. <laughs> and and when a majority of that representation is quite harmful or bad, um, it it makes it difficult. Um, but I think there's also just a beautiful aspect to the way the internet has made it very, very hard to restrict that understanding mm -hmm. and that engagement. Um, that's partly why I make the work that I make, is that I hope that people feel seen. Um, we've talked a lot about queer aspects, but I'll, you know, I, I also work on, on stuff with, with disability. And, and that second video I made, um, I make art to get feelings out, mm -hmm. you know? Um, usually complex feelings to just kind of like work through that feeling and, and expel it and have it in the world and not, um, you know, trapped inside of me. And th that second piece just came out of this consistent kind of rage that I had towards a lot of, of like left leaning figures response to a pretty inane statement about disability, but, but more broadly, just how often talking about ableism in even the lightest manner would get people so angry at you. And I wanted to talk about like where that feeling was coming from. Uh, and I wanted to get people to, to try to better understand what 
disabled people were talking about because I I saw two aspects, which is which is one side that was definitely correct, but wasn't like explaining. It was just stating. Um, and another side that was often purposefully misunderstanding and then actively harassing. Um, so it's not really specifically about that one thing. I just chose an example because it was a good example. It was a recent example. It was on mind and also that, that it was in the, it's in a, like, people are aware of it. So I don't have to explain the context because people are aware of it, you know? Um, and it was easy to understand the topic very, very quickly. Um, and I also wanted to talk about some specific aspects of a disabled experience with like the way that, that leaving the house is moralized. And um, I kind of had two audiences that I was trying to target with that video. And one was, was absolutely people who, who held that, that ableist viewpoint. I want to be very clear what I mean. They believed in this thing. The thing is ableist. That is not an inherency statement about them. If it was, I wouldn't bother making the video. Like, <laughs> which I don't understand why this is so hard for a lot of people to get. But, but, but when, when we talk about that, it is not a statement of like this person's evil. Because it, if the person is just inherently ableist, why the hell would I ever bother trying to explain? Mm hmm. They're never going to change if they're inherently that. And it's, it's such a frustrating thing that 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 I see a lot. Like that that, that that's the response. It's like the the point has gone right over your head. Right. Now I'll admit there are people that'll just do that. That'll just be like you're this and and whatever. I don't think they a owe that person explanation at all. Like it's a fucking lot of work to ex constantly have to explain those things. It's difficult to explain and and sometimes the people you're trying to explain it to are engaging with it in pretty bad faith. But that's why I did a video because. I could spend a thousand hours repeating the same fucking conversations a thousand times with a thousand different abled people that, you know, only so many of them are going to listen. Or I can just write the conversation once <laughs> and never have to have it again. Um, and so I, I got a couple of responses to that video that showed me that I'd gotten that audience perfectly. And the one that, that sticks out in my mind the most, and I really should go find that old tweet, was. Um, was I tweeted about the, the, the video a second time or whatever, and, and someone responded to the tweet uh, after they'd watched it saying, um, I want him to hate watch it. <laughs> like, that's how, that's how the, the tweet starts. And I don't remember the exact rest of the wording, but the statement, I have to begrudgingly admit, was part of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, you know what? First off, good That's on you. That's just the for sweetest a, thing to like, hear. Oh, it's fucking so sweet. <laughs> but you know what? Good on you for admitting that you came yeah. into it with a shit attitude and that you came out of it knowing you were wrong. Like, that's fucking awesome. Good on yeah. that person. Like, it. I I will never fucking shame or be mad at that person for like, because you know what? They listened and they understood that they were wrong and they. Not only that, they fucking publicly said so. That that takes courage and honesty and good for them. And I would like to see that more from people. Um, and I strive to do that myself. And um, like I want to be very clear, and I, I say this repeatedly on Twitter, if I fuck something up, if I am wrong, if I do something incorrect, I expect and want to be told that. I want yeah. to be told off for making mistakes. And, um, and there was a couple of other comments that responded that way. But the second audience I was trying to reach was, was validating other disabled people who had felt that their voice had been so devalued and so unheard and so unseen that, um, they didn't, you know, matter. And I just think it's, it's abhorrent that that we end up feeling that way quite often as, as marginalized people, but it's true. And like, you know, I, I got comments with stuff like, this is a very helpful video. It deserves so much more attention. I'm, I'm actually reading a real comedy mm -hmm. on video than it has gotten. And I hope more people watch it. It feels so validating to hear someone explain the problems with comments like go outside. Uh, later on in this, 
they also said, I also wanted to add that your explanation of how capitalism frames community was something I was aware of, but had never been able to word before. Because I spend most of my time online, most of my friends are online friends, and they mean so much to me. The online communities that I spend time with friends in are just as important to me as any friend slash community I have offline. Unfortunately, I find that most people I talk to do not understand at all. They don't seem to think that online friends or communities count. It feels horrible to be called a shut-in and antisocial when I consider myself a social butterfly. I love meeting people and making friends. It's just that I have a hard time leaving the house regularly due to chronic pain and accessibility issues, so I meet them online instead. Yeah. And like, it means a lot to me that this person felt seen yeah. and understood by the video. Um, and I just... I relate to that a lot on, on two levels, both as a disabled person who can't be out very often because it's difficult to. Um, I know I look physically fit, but I'm chronically ill. It affects my ability to function throughout the day. Um, layer two is just as a trans person, especially before I was able to come out, online communities is all I had. And there are people online that I am very intimately close to that I care deeply about that, you know, are our chosen family. And, and I like, like it's, I, I think, um, I think that can sometimes be a hard thing to understand if you've never had community. And the only way you've gotten that community is, is through an online, but it, you know, I think it's about connection and, and feeling connected to other people. And, when we talk about art, I think a lot of times art and our engagement with art just comes down to wanting to connect with other people. Mm -hmm. And I just, that's another reason why I despise the idea of inherency. Cause I don't think at our core as people, I don't think anyone, um, you know, fundamentally is incapable of, or does not want to connect with other human beings. I just think that there there can be a lot of factors that can like get in the way of that. Um, and a lot of those factors are systemic and trained and learned. And I I think fundamentally the systems of you know cis normativity or heteronormativity or allonormativity or or capitalism, you know, patriarchy, it what makes it so tragic is that it is about pushing down that that need for connection and for understanding and overriding it. And uh I just you know, you, you look at, at cultures and systems that existed outside of that. And there's no reason why we can't care about the people that are around us, that we can't reach out and, and listen and understand and grow with them. And I, I think it just, it is so much about teaching people to not engage with the subjective. It's about teaching people to value the privileged perspective to such a powerfully toxic degree that engaging with or acknowledging marginalized perspectives is actively dangerous to their fundamental core beliefs. And when our core beliefs are threatened, we respond like it is a physically violent threat. And, you know... I tend to be someone that is probably overly um, empathetic. I don't think that empathetic has a moral value. And I think that anyone who thinks that is, is a fool because hyper empathy is actually a very tough thing to deal with. It is not a, an inherently positive thing at all. And has often led to some of the worst things in my life because not knowing when to withdraw from, from caring about someone else um, has led to a lot of, you know, pain for me but i i think fundamentally that 
even though I've had those experiences and things, I I, I never want to stop caring about people. <laughs> and I I know that like they're not inherently evil. They're just so fucked up by all these different things in their life. Um that they couldn't bring themselves to care about other people. And yeah. I pity them. I don't hate them. I I don't know. There's nothing I hate more than being pitied. Yeah. I think it's actually the cruelest feeling you can have towards someone. It's so much crueler than hating them. Because well, it's, it's and and down. I mean <laughs> and, yeah, and hopefully, I mean all that's very well said and uh hopefully if we do things like we're doing now or in your work uh i think just exposing people to those ideas and more importantly exposing them to the idea that a reevaluation of where you're coming from does not mean ceasing to be the person you were and if it does maybe that's not a bad thing either mm -hmm. that and divorcing these value judgments of criticism from the the complete person that you are like you can be open to being critical of yourself and critical of others in a way that is not um essentialist or um anything like that and i i think that that's where we need to be what we need to get to and i I do appreciate that about your work, and uh, I hope that that other people will uh, check out what you're doing. And uh, I think uh, this might be a good spot to wrap up. Um, do you have any uh, Do you have any uh, last words of wisdom for our folks out there? Um, that meant a lot. Thank you. Uh, I at some point this is going to be a video. I'm going to talk about. Um, every objective subjective and intersubjective framework ever constructed within philosophy basically and explain why why uh objective review is a is a is bullshit no matter how you define objective uh mm -hmm. th that it doesn't exist like mm -hmm. it is a complete myth but the reason why um and this is the first thing that i wrote in this script and it's still just sitting there is this one sentence is the reason they believe their analysis is objective is that they believe there is only one perspective on art, and acknowledging that their view is subjective is to acknowledge the marginalized perspective as having equal or potentially greater value than their privileged identity perspective. Yeah. And, I mean, it's a simple statement, but I think it, it sums up so much of those types of interaction, not just with art, but with perspective in general, and, and, and especially pri privileged perspective, is that to acknowledge your privileged perspective. And I've I have perspectives that are privileged, right? Um, that come from a privileged place. Um requires, you know, truly understanding and acknowledging that that the marvel marginalized perspective um quite often has a greater value in the situation. Um and yeah. And that, you know, yours isn't the only one. I've done a lot of conflict resolution. Um, I worked as a coach for a long time. Kind of part of the job. And a lot of times it's about understanding both sides. Even when one group is very clearly in the wrong. Because people make terrible decisions and do really harmful shit that quite often from their perspective does not register mm -hmm. and getting them to understand the other perspective often also requires you understanding theirs and that's not an easy thing to do mm -hmm. um and as one last note <laughs> with that being said the only way to understand fascists is to understand that they are completely and irrevocably based in contradictions. That there is no logical argument, no amount of data, no amount of, of presentation of other things that will get through to them past their very core beliefs and feelings. 
and you will fail every single time. Because if you engage with them believing that they are in good faith, mm -hmm. they will use that against you to do harm. So, because I've stared into that fucking abyss. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's, uh, th it's not, uh, it doesn't admit. They, they are uh, a unique situation. Yeah. Uh, um, it's the the statement you can't logic somebody out of a position they felt their way into on steroids exponentially like it's just it's yeah like it is a completely unique situation and i just wanted to be very clear that like we're talking about all this like understanding and understanding of people who are wrong and stuff but like fascists aren't complicated they just want you to think that yeah fascists are at their core small angry children <laughs> who who feel a certain way and that thing that they feel is quite harmful and dangerous and the only way to get them out of it is to actively and vehemently oppose them mm -hmm. and and i say that because i've had conversations with people who have gotten out of genuine neo nazis you, you, you make it very difficult to be a fascist and <laughs> and yeah. they will stop being a fascist yes yeah, yeah. do and, not uh, like just make it as hard as possible for them <laughs> yeah. that's... And we will not provide specifics on how to do that but i'm sure there's people in your neighborhood who can um so <laughs> exactly all right aaronach thank you so much for joining us uh tell everybody where they can find you and uh yeah uh it's pretty much aranok everywhere a r a n o c k um on twitter it's at aranok one because someone who's never used their account <laughs> stole the the handle before i joined twitter uh youtube is is aranok twitch is aranok tiktok's aranok um we didn't really talk about this i do a lot of silly voice acting uh so if you <laughs> if you like impressions i do them <laughs> um on on tiktok but yeah um if you want some recommendations for my work, I would highly recommend um, watching the sort of uh, interrelated two pieces that I just finished. Uh, Doom, Rage, Exhaustion, and Arousal States. The funny name, but trust me, that's, that, that's a term that's very specific from psychology. And uh, it, it's, it's a discussion of, of engaging with what's generally considered negative emotions in media and why we do it and why it's important and valuable. Um, it's also a, a deep dive into the design of, of uh, the Doom remake. Um, and because of some stuff I touched on in there, uh, the second piece is authorial intent, difficulty settings or accessibility settings, where I discuss the ideological beliefs of gamers TM why they're harmful and un unrealistic and the viewpoint and design ethos of game designers and why that matters and why how we make art for other people matters. Um, and both come highly recommended. Uh, they're quite good. So mm -hmm. everybody go out there and check those out. And uh, Aaron Ock, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me.